Aloha, and welcome to Figments, the Power of Imagination. I'm so excited about today's episode because I'm not talking about gas prices or the Ukraine or COVID or any of the other myriad of things that have us somewhat depressed these days. I'm going to talk about something fun with somebody I like. Talk about Top Gun Maverick and give a fighter pilot review with my good friend Dallas Thompson, retired Major General, uh, Air Force type, and fellow fighter pilot. And we're going to review this movie without spoilage, just so you know. You feel free to watch this. If you haven't seen the movie, we're going to not ruin it for you. So let me say aloha, Dallas, and welcome from, or should I say howdy, since you're in Granbury, Texas. Howdy. Aloha. It goes, means the same thing here. Yeah, okay. Hey, this is going to be fun. And you just saw the movie two nights ago, I think. You and I have similar paths. We work together some. We talk about things that uh, matter to us, serious things. Uh, but basically, we're just fighter pilots. And uh, our, our paths were similar and converged at a certain point. I got a few pictures to flip through to talk about us and then about you. So we both went to pilot training in the T-38 uh, jet there. And everybody's got to get their picture like that. Uh, those are the days, huh? I, I looked at you when you sent your picture. I saw the Air Force issue hack watch, as we called it, because you could hack the time very easily, extremely low tech. And then they made you wear a name tag that just had your name on, ha on half of the Velcro waiting for wings. And you looked like the dork student that you were compared to the guys who had a nice, bright, shiny pair of wings atop it. Uh, so that brings back memories. But then in 2003, our paths crossed directly uh, in uh, Bahrain, uh, Kuwait, and Iraq when we were both air component coordination element directors during the invasion of Iraq, our Operation Iraqi Freedom. That brings back some memories, doesn't it? Yep. And the reason you were the ACE director, as it was called, to the Navy was you had a Navy background in your Air Force career that I'll share with. And that got you to fly Navy airplanes through friendships that you'd made with the Navy. I, on the other hand, made my friends in the Army, and what did that get me a, An all-expense-paid road trip to, ba to Baghdad. I should have chosen better. No, I enjoyed my time with the Army, but yours was a little more pleasing to a fighter pilot. Uh, so you were an F-15 fighter pilot in your first fighter assignment after being an instructor in Air Training Command, the Mighty Eagle. And we might have time to debate which airplanes. Who are those kiddos with you? Or they can oh, you probably can't see. Well, they were both, those are my two oldest granddaughters, and they were both at the movie with me on Saturday night. Yeah, which is very cool. We'll get to that in a bit. The Mighty Eagle, a great airplane. After that, uh, after you went to fighter weapons school, which is analogous but not the same as Top Gun. Uh, you went and flew the F-18 and the F-14 with the Navy. What's going on here? You get a nice, cool drink of water after a demanding sortie in the F-18? When, uh, when I was offered the job by the skipper out at VX-4, I said, hey, can I go to the ship? Will you send me to the ship? Even though that wasn't necessarily part of the duties. I mean, I, it, was, it turned out it worked out. They worked it into a test. We had to take an airplane two airplanes to the ship to do a, a viable test. And before I took the job, uh, the, the guy that offered me the job said, absolutely, I'll send you a ship. So there, I am just just got back from uh, two days on the ship and my Navy wings are at the bottom of that mug of champagne. So <laughs> I had to chug the champagne to get my Navy wings. Only one way to get them. And, and that's a big deal because to go to the ship doesn't just mean you take a little rowboat or something fly aboard a car to carry your onboard delivery. I mean, you have to actually be able to land on the ship and landing in the catapult uh, takeoff is, is really something to experience. Uh, so you got to fly, fly both the Hornet and the F-14 and both featured in Top Gun versions, actually both of them in the latter version. So that gives you a unique perspective. Viewers, what I'm doing here is setting the table for why Dallas Thompson is the ultimate commentator on this, because you're also a uh, graduate of fighter weapons school. And um, you got a picture of you and your fighter weapons school 
class. Whoops, that's your Viper time there. Hopefully we'll get your fighter weapons school class up here. Um, and if not, we'll just say you went to fighter weapons school, which is like Top Gun, only different. What are the differences between Top Gun and fighter weapons school? Now, very few. Then, completely different. Mm -hmm. And the difference was when, when I went to fighter weapons school, my instructors were instructors in the F-15. We flew with and were paired with the, the fighter weapons school instructors. Right. In, in those days, the instructors were the adversary pilots, just like they were in the original Top Gun movie. Over time, as a matter of fact, towards the end of my time at, uh, at weapons school mm -hmm. and flying F-16s, the, the two schools had regular exchanges. Right. And, and the Navy moved to the Air Force model. Right. Years later. Which was, which was more robust, frankly. I mean, the, the Top Gun, the, not to denigrate it, but it was largely a flying experience. And the uh, fighter weapons school in the Air Force was and remains really a doctoral level flying, thinking, writing, leading uh, program. And now that they are more similar. So you had some guys that I know, Rick Von B, Von Birkfeldt, uh, Tim Fida, other folks in your classmate, but were you or were you not the top graduate in your fighter weapons school? Class? I was not. Tim Fida. You were the distinguished graduate. I was. Ah. I was a distinguished graduate. Tim Fida, Tim Fida won the Reisner Trophy that year. The top the Reisner Trophy, yeah. Uh, and he was my closest bud in that class. So, so that brings, that's exactly what I want to come up. Is it, is it an Iceman Maverick kind of a rivalry or not? I don't think I, I mean, there were, there were guys, uh, and you had them all through your career. Sure. I mean, there were guys that, you know, wanted to, uh, wanted to kind of chip at the, at your, at your shoulder, you know, kind of peck at you a bit. I didn't, I didn't take the bait most of the time. I, I Most kind of, of the time. Most of the time. So, no, Fido and I were, were great buds. I got, he won the flying trophy. I won the academic trophy. I remember I came home. We were stationed in Germany at the time, but my wife was staying with my parents. And we went to graduation from weapons school. We came, took a Southwest flight home very early the next morning. And I walked in and showed them the, the trophy for the academic uh, trophy. <laughs> And my mother looks at me and says, why didn't you win the flying trophy? Yeah, way to go, Mom. And I said, because Tim Fida was my classmate. And there you have it. Uh, but there is, there is competition, and sometimes it takes on a bit of a personal note. Uh, it, when we get deep into the movie review in about two minutes, we'll, we'll talk about how that was, what you thought of how they did it uh, in this movie. The, uh, it did bring back memories for me. I was on the elliptical a day or two later at the gym and just thinking, do I have any, any um, Top Gun-like memories? And I did not go to weapons school, uh, kind of a little late to the Eagle. And, and it's a, the, you know, the, only the right people go to fighter weapons school, frankly, and I might not have been the right one. I think I was a damn good fighter pilot, but, but anyway, I thought about a training story and my ice man was at the time briefly for this moment was a guy named Frog Peel. Did you ever know Clark Frog Peel? He was an Eglin guy before that F4s and F5s at Clark as an aggressor. And a great, great guy, excellent fighter pilot, but somebody that you'd love to shoot. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so Frog was leading the 12 or so adversaries. Um, maybe more against my 12 ship of F-15 down in the pit, protecting a bunch of F-4s in a, in a big mass force thing. And we went out and did pretty well. I was the mission commander. But the, the moment was uh, when I was looking for the last bad guy alive and an F-5 popped up over a ridge line. And I went to the radio frequency where you make a call directly to the bad guys and said, Fox do kill. Lizard F5, right turn Eva Valley. And the radio call, Frog's dead. 
was one of the greatest moments of my life. So, Brock, I'm sorry for sharing that with the whole world, but but you're a great fighter pilot, and shooting you was a lot of fun. Okay. So speaking of frogs and ice men, and we know, we'll talk a little bit about movies later. Uh, were you always Dallas, and where does that call sign come from? Uh, as soon as I got to Bitburg, but back in those days, and I imagine it was the same in Pac as it was in Yusefi. Yep. We all had we all had to have a personalized call sign, so that when we led a flight, it was Dallas flight or whatever. So it had to be deconflicted mm -hmm. throughout the theater. So as part of, uh, in those days, I was a big Dallas Cowboy fan. I am so sorry to hear that. It's harder now than it was then. <laughs> but anyway, anyway, we, the first squadron party that, that we were at on base housing there at Bitburg, I wanted to be Cowboy, but a guy in the sister squadron, the 2-2, was already Cowboy. Yeah. So anyway, we had a, a squadron party, and uh, I was kind of set up. And I was introduced to this drinking game with a uh, beverage called Stroh's Rum. It's an Austrian rum, like 120. Uh, Excuse me, this was a drinking game with fighter pilots? It was. Mm. It was. And, I, um, and it was also the first time that AFRTS was televising a live football game. And it happened to be the Cowboys and the Redskins. Okay. The I got, overseas TV service for armed forces personnel for those. Who I got a little. I got a little fired up, uh, and the next day I walked into the squadron. That was a Sunday night. Next Monday morning, I walked into the squadron. Squadron commander was a guy named Jim Vegas Cox, and he had his feet up on the ops desk. Uh, I can see it. And he looked at me and he says, "Your Delta Tau Chi name is Dallas." And so it was, so you never had one before that. I actually had something other than Tig uh, from pilot training, a guy named Tony Mefford, the late Tony Mefford sadly passed away. That's awesome. Awesome. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, pilot training F4 RTU classmate. I won't share that today. But they are part of what happens. And if you ever walk in, folks, to a fighter squadron heritage room, which may look oddly like a bar, you might notice a really nice TV or stereo that was probably purchased by somebody who bought their way out of a call sign they didn't want. So that's the way it works. It, it is part of the culture. Who is the original Iceman? Dallas, I told you that. You just gave me the answer to that. I did. Yeah. I've, I, it's been years since I've watched The Hunters, but it's my dad flew F-86s. Oh, really? So, yeah. Wow. So that is, for you know sentimental reasons, that's one of my favorite movies. I had forgotten completely that Robert, the Robert Mitchum character was Iceman. So uh, he was, and Ed Pell, what a great movie. But we're supposed to talk about Top Gun Maverick, which is a huge hit. And not just with fighter pilots like us, it's a huge hit. A, a bit of escapism that I think we all need. Um, did you like it? We, uh, uh, I did. I liked it very, very much. I liked it wow. very much more than the original. Why did you like it? What what did you like about the movie? I think it was a more serious. No spoilers. Remember, don't spoil no, anything. Not gonna spoil. Okay, I think it was a more serious. Uh, it was a more serious script. It was a more serious story. I think the flying, even though there was a lot of CGI intermixed mm -hmm. with it, I thought the flying was was generally more realistic. I was impressed with the way that they worked. This may be a, a spoiler, but a concept of mission rehearsal. Yeah, I was thinking about that as we got ready to do this. And I was uh, yeah. I was impressed with that. Uh, I was impressed with the notion that old girlfriends never go away. They can pop back up <laughs> at any time. Not going there. Um, I, I hope that's only in the movies. Uh, and you said it was, the flying was more realistic. It wasn't totally realistic, no. was it? No. And, no. You, you shared a comment from Boa Strait, another great fighter pilot that you and I both know, another weapons school grad. The Boa flew F-5s in the original Top Gun. And what did he tell you about the, the, it, the evolution of the flying in the original Top Gun? It was a couple of years after the movie had come out and we were at a party at Langley and, and Boa was there and we just got to talking. And, and he said, you know, the producers came in right up front and they said they want this flying to be completely realistic 
everything, all the tactics, everything to be just as we would do it in combat. So early on, they came in and were rush, watching the rushes of the first aviation film with the producers. And the producers look up on the screen at the gun camera film and they go, what's that? <laughs> and, they, and the guys go, well, that's the target. That's, that's the A4 out in front. That of the, little speck. That's a speck. And he goes, well, how far away is it? He says, well, I'm heart of the envelope. I'm 6,000 feet. I'm heart of the envelope for a, for a heat-seeking missile shot. So the producers kind of huddled after all that. They looked through that, and they came in the next day, and they said, forget everything we said about the flying vegan realist. We want you up, tucked in real here and real close so you know, we can see the other airplane. And, and so that, that part went out, the, uh, went out the window. I thought the second version, it was not completely realistic, but it was much more than the original. And I, I took note of that. Yeah, I thought they did a, a great job. And I haven't found a fighter pilot who uh, really took umbrage with the poetic license that the producers uh, had to take to make it watchable. Because, you know, as we know, we're flying two miles apart in our tactical formation. And that isn't right up there filling up the big screen. So um, they have to do it. I thought they did an excellent job of it. I thought there were two elements, um, Dallas, I'd like your thoughts on this, and I'll break them into those two elements and address each separately, that were totally unrealistic. Number one, the whole, and I don't want to spoil it, but the notion that a fighter pilot would enter a bar not knowing the rules, I found that offensive. You know, folks, watch the movie, but oh, yeah, come on, man. But I thought the I thought the the post the post to the to the original faux pas was very realistic. Yeah, absolutely. It it, it was uh, and it was fun and you know it's hard to capture. Uh, it is hard to convey what we experienced as fighter pilots and I, what I think young fighter pilots do today. It's a special world, folks, and I'm not going to apologize for having been blessed with getting to it or the fact that. Many of you wouldn't like elements of it. Too bad. Get over it. Uh, I thought they captured that the camaraderie, the spirit, with one exception, really well. How about you? Did that, you know, did, did that feel right to you? No, and actually, I felt like it was more uh, the whole teamwork mm -hmm. aspect, uh, as opposed to the the competitive aspect of the first movie. Yeah, I, I thought that that was a much better vehicle to show mission, the primacy of mission, the primacy of the best, the best pilots get to fly the mission regardless. Yep. I and, thought that and, was a good, good story. And as a leader of a winning William Tell team, another thing in your resume, you, you know that. That was a, a spare on a Kadena Willie Tell team that, and we got our butts kicked, frankly. It was not the most fun three months of my life. Uh, Willie Tell, William Tell being the Air Force Worldwide Weapons Competition. But performance matters, and really nothing else matters more than that. And so we put the best people in. But Dallas, I thought they did a real good job in, uh, in that sequencing and teamwork, even though it wasn't technically perfect. The idea of somebody designating for somebody else and the timing having to be perfect. And well, I have done that in combat. In, and it was it exactly like that? No. Is it really hard? Yes. Do you count on everybody? Absolutely. When it goes right, it's a pretty good feeling. It, yeah. it doesn't always go right. Um, so I, I thought that was uh, really, they, they did capture the teamwork very well. Um, the, how, did it, how did it make you feel? When you walked out of the theater, what, you know, what, what's... Are, were you a young fighter pod again in your own mind? What, what was the dealio? One of the granddaughters that was in the picture of, with us at the Eagle, that was taken at a museum at Peterson Air Force Base. <laughs> when we went in, she said, Granddad, I want to sit next to you. So all, the through, movie. all through the movie, she's leaning over and she's asking me questions. Is this real? Is, can this be done? Whatever. And I felt like I was a technical advisor to the to the audience, you know. <laughs> I love it. Uh, 
at, yes, I felt, I felt great. I felt great at being able to help her understand better what it was that I was, like you say, very privileged to get to do. Yep. And, uh, and the kids, there was a little bit of discussion uh, taking all the grandkids because it was a PG-13. Yep. We ran it up the, ran it up the approval. Family flagpole. <laughs> family flagpole and it was all approved. And they all had, they all loved it. They all had a blast. So oh, great. I, um, that's, that's, that was probably the thing that made me feel best about the whole experience. Well, Alejandro and I were blessed to watch it in historic Hangar 79 at Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum with a huge American flag blowing in the breeze there on Fort Island, the first building attack in the attack on Pearl Harbor with a Hornet and a Tomcat behind us. And I've got goosebumps right now thinking about it. Uh, so that was a great environment. But um, Alejandra didn't know me as a young fighter pilot. She knows me now. and. She's heard the stories and she's run into enough of my friends that for me, the, the best thing was, and I'm again, I'm aware of not spoiling the movie for folks, was it illustrated something that she's come to know about me from, from hearing me and meeting a few of my flying friends. And that's it. Um, I was always a stickler on discipline, calm radio communication. And my mantra it had four words, two of them were shut up. Uh, there might have been a few words, a couple of words between them, because radio comm is so important. And, and if you're not disciplined in training, I'm sorry, you're not going to get more discipline while you're being shot at. And I validated that theory later by getting shot at a bit. Um, yeah. So that isn't the way Hollywood does it. Okay, there's got to be drama because it's a movie, and that's fine. So we walked out of Top Gun Maverick. And the first thing I did was turn to Alejandra and said, Mia Moore, what did you learn? She smiled and said, shut up. Yes. <laughs> so it was, I just uh, thought it was a great movie and um, uh, really something that the audience needs because it hasn't been much fun lately. And it was a fun movie and it illustrates folks who will sacrifice for their country um, and give something back, we'll risk it all. We did. We we're lucky we didn't have to pay the piper, but we know folks who did. And, um, you know, that's sad, but it's not tragic. Tragic would be not having people like that who are willing to pay that price, in my mind. So, um, anything else about the movie other than go watch it, people? Go see Top Gun Maverick. Uh my very first impression. That's the first movie I think I've been to where the star of the movie uh, leads off the entire presentation and thanks you for attending. I had not oh. seen that before. Now that maybe is a little bit of a spoiler, but that that set me on the right frame of mind right off the bat. Yeah, the, my, another thought that I had um, getting ready for this discussion with you, Dallas, is uh, there were there were things that weren't quite right from a tactical fighter pilot perspective. The movie moved so quickly, you didn't have time to dwell on them. One of the real beauties of it is it's just a boom, 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 not so fast. If you blink, you miss it. Sometimes spy thrillers are like that where you go, no, wait, wait a minute, who was it? This was a well-paced and rapidly paced movie that kept you flying right to the finish. And Great. Uh, yeah, I really enjoyed it. Well, Dallas, uh, it's been great to review that. People go see the movie. Um, I know that, as I said, the tragic thing isn't people we lose. It's, it would be not having people like that. You're one of the folks who flew fighters um, and could have retired comfortably, but you stay actively involved in security matters. And uh, I know that because you write a lot. Uh, I tend to write a lot. How did how did that happen? How did once you finished flying and you were later the chief of staff at uh, NORAD Northcom and had other key jobs within the Air Force Reserve hierarchy, but uh, what are you doing and why are you doing it? When I was the chief at NORAD Northcom, and again, I retired 10 years ago, this July. Yeah. Uh, a lot of the things that are out in open source right now we're still behind 
classified doors. Mm -hmm. The concern, especially with the development of cruise missiles and the improvements to specifically the Korean intercontinental ballistic missiles were causing my commanders, all three of them, serious heart nice. yeah. uh, We were deeply involved with the Missile Defense Agency the whole time I was there. So if I can shorten the answer, it was at the very top of my boss's problem list. And so I became, and the rest of the staff, became deeply involved in searching out solution sets. As things became uh, unclassified through the years, and I could speak to those issues because I had just seen it in James come out, you know, the day or two before. Uh, I am I am very concerned about the defense of this country, not just the homeland, but Hawaii and our forces in the Pacific yeah, and our forces in Europe, their ability to defend themselves against missile attacks. And it's not, I, I don't feel like I'm on a, I'm tilting at windmills, but I, I do want to help elevate the discussion level so that specifically members, staffers, decision makers within the department and in the administration may have a, a completely uh, agnostic view. Mm -hmm. words, there's no agenda, there's no policy, and there's no politics. It's just the facts and hopefully a thread drawn for them on a solution, a way forward. Yep, and, and that's why I like uh, talking with you, working with you. Um, this is kind of a spoiler alert. Dallas and I have been working on a thought piece about, about nuclear blackmail. We think there's been a very significant transition in the thinking on the use of nuclear weapons around the world, and we're worried about it. We care about our country. If we didn't care about our country and the world, we wouldn't have done what we did. Yeah, it was a hoot. Yeah, we had fun at the bar on Friday night, and we loved flying fast, low, doing all those things. But the basic motivation was to defend the country. So, um, Dallas, I, I really appreciate your friendship and, and the chance to work and think with you um, and today to, to talk the movie. I got to have you back, man. You passed. You said, baby, I wouldn't want, but we have to talk your flanker story and being the first Western pilot qualified in the Su-27 flanker way back in 1994, right? right. And we had a couple pictures that I kind of skipped over that. Uh, I think I can find it here. Uh, of you in a cockpit in a flanker. We'll see. There you are. And you, you did this in Russia with Russian support. And uh, being Russia, it was what? It was cold. It was February. <laughs> it was so will you come back and talk about that with me? Absolutely. Would love to. All right. It's, it's been great. Let me close with uh, what would Fig do. And what Fig would do is uh, go watch the movie, Top Gun. Give yourself a break. Uh, then go find on YouTube. Uh, the hunters i'll be back on the 27th so another thing to do is join me there i have no idea what i'm going to talk about yet because the world has provided too many options um so please join me for figments the power of imagination you can find both figments and uh, uh figments on reality the other version i did for a while on youtube spotify etc cetera, etc cetera, or at the think tech homepage. and with that let me thank Think Tech Hawaii, our platform that gives citizen journalists a chance to pontificate, bloviate, whatever eight, but today just review a movie. Dallas Thompson, Major General, retired Supreme Fighter Pilot. It's been great having you. Aloha, brother. Thank you, sir.
Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.